Welcome here, everyone. Let's pray for boldness as we connect with God. But before we actually pray, let's take a look at our theme verse. Psalm 138 verse 3 says, On the day I called, you answered me. You made me bold in my soul with strength. The question that we're going to tackle today is this. What is prayer? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for this time that you've brought us together. Thank you for the people you've brought to this video. I ask that you would speak through me as I present your word, and that you would hide me behind your precious cross, and everyone would see you and less of me. More of you, less of me. With these things, I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's look at a short story. A mother and a child lived in the Amazon. One day, they went into the mighty forest to play. When the mother and her child finished playing, the night and pitch dark had set in. They didn't see the path that would lead them back home. So the mother had two options. Either she could rely on her own strength to find the path home, or she could rely on the power of God to find the path home. Whether it's coincidence or not, the mother chose the second option, and she closed her eyes to pray. The only prayer that she knew was pretty straightforward, and it went like this. Oh Lord, please be with us. Help us and guide us. When the mother opened her eyes, she saw a man walking by. So she took her child by the hand and followed him. Before they knew it, yeah, they were led back home. This is an excellent reminder of what prayer is supposed to be. When we press into the power of God, we will consistently be surprised by the way he answers us. Now, prayer is our starting point. Just as the mother put prayer first in her life, let's do the same this week as we take practical steps toward God as we connect with him boldly. Can you think of a time when you were in a situation just like the mother and her child? Well, I can. So here's my story. One time, I remember, I was a kid at camp. I was about 14. I was out late with some friends, and it was time for us to head back to the cabins for the night. It was dark, and the only light we had was from the moon and the stars. Right now, my friends and I looked at each other with a touch of panic in our eyes. What do we do? So I asked them, can we pray? They said, well, sure, we're at Bible camp, so let's pray. So we prayed in a simple prayer like this. Lord, we're scared right now. We need to get back to the cabin for the night, and right now we ask that you would show us the way back. Now my friends and I opened our eyes, and we saw our cabin leader, Jeremy, walking toward us. <laughs> Jeremy was always to the point, so he asked us a simple question that was very rhetorical. He said, hey, you need some help getting back? <laughs> my friends and I looked at each other and said, well, yeah. So we followed him, set in for the night, and we took practical steps toward boldness as we connected with God through prayer. So ask yourself, what is prayer? This week, I encourage you to allow God to answer your questions. Please open to Acts 4.23. I've seen prayer as a vital interaction between God and His people. It's not a ritual. Instead, it's based on our relationship with God. It's about conforming our will to His will. Harry Emerson Fodswick put this perfectly when he said, Prayer opens our lives for God so His will can be done in and through us 
Because in true prayer, we habitually put ourselves into the attitude of willingness to do whatever God wills. With this, let's dive into our passage. Acts 4, 23-31 says, When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? So the kings of the earth set themselves. The rulers were gathered together against the Lord and his anointed. For truly in this city, they were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined them to take place. Now, Lord, look upon the threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with boldness while you stretch your hand out and heal and signs and wonders are performed through us in the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they had gathered together was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. The early church prayed for boldness while amid persecution, so we can follow their lead and do the same. The early church is now looking down the barrel of a gun, it seems. The threats were enormous. From the beginning, the early church met with challenges to its belief from both within and without. First, the fledging early church had to avoid being swallowed up by some of the influential religions of the day, cults. Then it had to face significant divisions within its own ranks. As I thought about this passage, I asked God to help me as I faced threats in my own life. Though these threats aren't really anything like the early church faced, they're what I face. It's not helpful to dismiss the threats that we face in our lives because they aren't as severe as what other people have faced or do face today. Instead, let's allow God to meet us where we're at. These believers in the book of Acts are ready to enter the world. They aren't willing to sit back and hide while being threatened. Instead, these believers ask for boldness as they face the threats of their day. It's interesting to note that their boldness didn't come from their own strength. Instead, it came from the power of the Holy Spirit. See verse 31? This is what it says. And when they had prayed, the place in which they gathered together was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. It seems that these believers' boldness came from their deep understanding of how God works. God is always entirely in control. Remember, prayer is our starting point. In this story I first shared, the mother put prayer first in her life. Perhaps this wasn't intentional, and it might have been something she did in the heat of the moment, but either way, she took the first steps toward boldness. Let's follow her example by pressing practically into the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, 5. Here, Jesus spurs us toward boldness. Take a look at some questions with me. Does prayer work? If so, how? What can we expect from prayer? 
Is there a right and a wrong way to pray? Well, I've come to believe that prayer works. I believe in the power of prayer. Look at verse 29 to 30. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. That's why prayer works. It works because God cares about what we care about. Prayer changes the outcome of our days, our weeks, and even our months. When we pray, we're reflecting on what we believe about God. I believe that God is a generous God and he's waiting for us to ask him for more. That's what we can expect from prayer. I don't think that there are right and wrong ways to pray. But I do think that there are specific methods of prayer that can help us connect with God as we produce boldness. One of the most helpful methods of prayer that I've come across in my life is based on the word Acts. This will be familiar to you because Acts follows the same basic format as the Lord's Prayer. Acts stands for first adoration. Matthew 6, 9 puts this perfectly. Our Father in heaven, let your name be kept holy. This section focuses directly on God, adoring Him for who He is, His name, His character, and His role. Worship and praise God with your mind, your heart, and your voice. Second, there's confession. Matthew 6, 12 puts this perfectly. Forgive our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. This section acknowledges that we can't stand before the throne of a holy God with sin between us and Him. But thank God that He is faithful and just to forgive our sins, right? Third, there's thanksgiving. Matthew 6, 13b puts it perfectly. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. This section enters into a time of thanking God for what He has done. We thank Him for the many blessings in our lives, His protection, His provision, and His awesome gifts. Fourth, there's supplication. Matthew 6, 11 and 13a put this perfectly. Give us our bread for tomorrow, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This section enters into a time of asking God for his help to meet our needs, solve our problems, and work in and through our lives. Let's see how Jesus teaches his disciples to pray in Matthew 6, 5-15. Jesus says, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that others may see them. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before asking. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, let your name be kept holy. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us our bread for tomorrow and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. What a word. Prayer is supposed to have a proper purpose and practice. The Lord's Prayer occurs within the Sermon on the Mount. Here, Jesus taught about his kingdom program. As they were sitting on the mountain, Jesus describes the character, actions, and motivations and contrasts them with the teachings and practices of the scribes and Pharisees. Here, Jesus is contrasting their kingdom program with his kingdom program. Jesus exposes the self-righteousness and self-centered practices of the scribes and Pharisees, while also explaining the practice of a godly person. In this section, Jesus teaches about proper prayer. In verses 5 to 8, Jesus explains the proper purpose and practice of prayer before giving the proper pattern of prayer in verses 9 to 15. Most, if not all of us, have learned our practices of prayer from others. However, there are two wrong ways that Jesus is speaking against here. First, there is the foolishness of repeating formal prayers so many times that they're said without thought to the meaning of what is being prayed. How often have you done that? Second, Jesus is speaking against praying the same prayer over and over and over again. As if God doesn't hear us the first time, right? It's true that we continue to persevere in prayer and will often pray for the same thing for years even. But the point here is not to spend hours making the same request to God because he hears us and he answers us in his timing and in his manner. Remember, prayer works. It works because God cares about what we care about. Prayer changes the outcome of our days, our weeks, and our months. When we pray, we're reflecting on what we believe about God. I believe that God is a generous God and he's waiting anxiously for us to ask him for more. So let's do that. That's what we can expect from prayer. Our methods of prayer can be helpful for us to produce boldness as we connect with God. Acts has identified four takeaways for us. So let's apply adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication in our daily prayer life in the coming week. To end off, let's look at how prayer produces boldness as we connect with God. We start prayer by giving God praise and honoring Him for who He is. Then, we ask God to honestly deal with the sin in our lives. After this, we speak about what we're grateful for in our lives and the world around us. Then, we pray for the needs of others and ourselves. God's blessing is given to those who are in a vibrant, lively relationship with Him. Sometimes we will need extra doses of strength from God. The blessing of God can even open doors for us with others. Wouldn't you love that for God to use you? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for speaking through me to these people, to your people. I ask that you would go with us into the rest of the week and prepare our hearts for what you're going to do in and through us. We pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.